All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the infinite limit. We talked about that last week. Uh, we introduced that, that first, the, the first issue involved with the infinite limit, and that was uh, one of our path- pathological cases was the, the asymptote. Right, anytime we have an asymptote as part of a graphic structure, that indicates a failure of the limit uh, in, in two different ways. Here, this example here, uh, we have... Uh, uh, two issues. Number one, the, the limit, val- the function values aren't settling down. Right? As I approach, in this example, as I approach one, uh, from one direction, the, the function values become bigger and bigger. So in that sense, the limit fails because the limit only exists if the function values are settling down to some finite value. Uh, and then at the same time, I see the opposite behavior coming from the left. I've got uh, this function now, as I approach from the left-hand side, is getting smaller and smaller without bound closer I get to the limit point, the smaller the function values. Uh, so once again, the limit fails because it's not settling down. But we do describe these two behaviors according to the infinity. So as uh, the function rises, we call it uh, the limit uh, infinite, uh, infinite, positive infinity. And as the limit fall, the uh, function values fall, we call those uh, limit behavior negative infinity. Um, but uh, in this example, we would say, uh, you know, if I had to say something about the big limit, I'd say it fails because uh, left and right aren't the same. But at the same time, uh, left and right fail in a sense because they're not settling down, but we do describe that behavior in a different way. So uh, even though these are both, uh, both these left and right approaches fail to satisfy the limit condition, we do give them names. We call those use infinities to describe this behavior uh, symbolically. Um, so uh, how do we uh, how do we I- examine uh, that sort of behavior uh, in more uh, in a more consistent way? Uh, well, again, uh, here's the here's the, uh, the the statement. What does this mean? Right? As x approaches a, if the limit is equal to infinity, what does that mean? Well, what it means is the value of f of x can be, be made arbitrarily large. I can make the function value as large as I want it just by getting close, sufficient, uh, x sufficiently close to the value a. So no matter how large of a value I want the function to take on, I can make it that big just by getting x close enough to a. Uh, and similarly for negative infinity, same idea, right? I can make the function value as small as I want just by getting x close enough to the point a. Whenever an infinite limit exists in either direction, we always have the asymptote. The vertical asymptote was always the graphic structure. I just showed you a picture of it. Uh, you know, we use a little dotted line. Dotted vertical line represents the uh, asymptote. It's defined by an equation, right? The asymptote as a vertical line is always described as x equals, um, x equals whatever the limit point is. And there's lots of possibilities about how a function behaves around the limit point. Uh, around the asymptote. Uh, It could be rising or falling, right? Uh, In this direction we might have uh, we might have this. We might have the function rising from both directions. Uh, They could go in opposite directions like in the last one. We might see it falling from the left, uh, falling from the right, rising from the left. It could be going down in both directions. All these are possible outcomes. And that's what we want to be able to anticipate, right? Based on a function uh, function formula. uh, No, well two things. from the limit form, I want to be recognized whether the limit is going to be infinite or not, and if it is infinite, in which direction. And uh, if I look at the two approaches, what would that tell me about the, the, the big limit? And so uh, the main tip off is this this is a limit form that always generates the infinite case. Anytime I get some number over zero where the numerator is not zero itself, so a non zero number over zero. Now, I've talked about the case where both parts are zero. Right? That's the indeterminate form. That may or may not exist. It may or may not be infinite. Uh, but if the numerator is not zero, and this is under direct substitution. If I do a direct substitution, the numerator is not zero, but the denominator is, then I'm guaranteed this will be the infinite case. Um, three ways in which the big limit can exist here. It could be positive infinity, negative infinity, or it might not exist. And it all depends on the left and right behaviors. So the question is, uh, in particular, we've already looked at this graphically. Uh, If I don't have a graph to look at, uh, can I anticipate how this is going to work itself out? Um, So here's number one. Here's a table of values. 
we've already done this, right? We did this for, uh, and, you know, table of values can be used to estimate just about any limit form. The question becomes, what are you looking for? Right? How do I tell from looking at the table of values that the limit will be infinite in one direction or the other? And so uh, I've got um, a, a table here that illustrates the limit for this function from both directions. So I want the limit to approach negative 2 for this function here. Huh? Uh, uh, and first, so first of all, what's the, what do I get under direct substitution in particular? If I'm looking at the big limit, right, if I wanted to look at the limit as x approaches 2, uh, negative 2 of this, uh, by direct substitution, what do I get? I get negative 2 in the numerator. I get 0 in the denominator. So now I know for sure this will be infinite. This is the infinite form. The numerator is not equal to zero, but the denominator is. So I know this is going to be infinite. The question is, what kind of infinity, in particular, from left and right, what do I see? So here's the setup that we used in the previous case. Right? Uh, I'm looking at my number line here. I'm looking at the point negative two, and I'm trying to figure out how can I make an approach towards the limit value, or towards the limit point, that will allow me to observe function values and uh, infer the actual limit value. And we do this in the same way. Again, it's a process. You have to look at this over a sequence of steps. Uh, and uh, once again, this, the, the usual thing, I start at a point about a tenth of a unit away. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong side. <laughs> Uh, starting from the left-hand side, I'm starting here. Right, this is my left-hand approach. Right, that's this one. I start from the left at a point about a tenth of a unit away, and then I start to move closer. Here's the same uh, path, the same approach that we used earlier, about a hundredth of a point a unit away. Move closer still. Here's a point that's a thousandth of a unit away. Right. Um, hmm, I don't know where that came from. Don't look at that. Okay, so what do I see? How did the function values behave? Uh, well, 21, 201, 2001, it's getting bigger and bigger. It's not settling down. It continues to get large. And I think what happened here, I think the reason it showed me a 2 here is because I tried to use this. I tried to use a ten thousandth of a unit, uh, but my calculator decided, well, I can't tell that that's too small now. I'm just going to make that 2. I think that's what it did here. Um, I think this is, this is probably an older model. I hadn't looked at if, if it would do the same thing on the new model. Okay. And the same thing from the other direction, right? Start about a tenth of a unit away on the right-hand side, so negative 1.9. Move a little bit closer to a hundredth of a unit, negative 1.99. Closer still, negative 1.999. So there's that exact same approach that we used in the previous case. And again, this must have been 0.19999, but the calculator decided to round it off because I'm getting so close. What do I see? Well, again, I don't see anything settling down. What I see is the limit values are getting more and more negative. Okay, so based on these tab tabular results, what can I conclude? Uh, looking at those results, what do you think we're going to say about the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left? Looks like it's going to positive infinity, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's the conclusion that I'm going to draw from this table. The values aren't settling down, they're just continuing to uh, increase. What do you think I'm going to say about the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right hand side? Negative infinity. Now it looks like they're getting more and more negative. They're not settling down, but every time I get closer, the value of the function becomes more and more negative. So this is an example of where we would say negative infinity for the behavior. So that's what I'm looking for in the tables. I'm looking for the failure of these points to settle down, but they're continually moving in one direction or the other, getting larger or getting smaller. Now again, I'm not sure that this is going to continue. It's possible that something might break down somewhere along the way. Maybe I'll get within a millionth of a unit and all of a sudden the behavior changes. You can't be sure that that's not going to happen. Um, but, uh, based on the observation up to this point, we're going to make the estimate, we're going to draw the inference, contingent inference, that the behavior is positive and negative for the two approaches.
And so finally, what can I now say, based on these results, what can I say about the big limit? Doesn't exist. Why not? For the usual reason, because the left and the right limits are not the same. And so that tells me something about this function's graph. Knowing this uh, behavior, I can now anticipate exactly, first of all, I know there's an asymptote here. So if I were to actually uh, graph this, um, let me see, do I have a graph here somewhere I can stick in here? Yeah, here's one. Um, uh, for this graph here, I can actually draw a conclusion about the behavior around the asymptote. Uh, so here's my asymptote right here at negative two. As I come in from the left-hand side, the graph is moving towards positive infinity. As I come in from the right-hand side, the graph is moving towards negative infinity. So there is uh, at least close to the asymptote, that's what's happening. I'm moving upwards as I come in from the left, downwards as I come in from the right. But different directions, so the limit itself fails. Okay, uh, so uh, again, this table here on this side is the right-hand approach. So same idea behind this tabular method. We create the two paths, plug them into our calculator, and let the calculator do the computation. We observe the behavior, we draw the conclusion. And the conclusion here is the infinite behavior. We knew it would be, right? As long as we recognize this infinite form, I know it's gonna be infinite in one direction or the other. All I've gotta do is settle that issue of which direction. Um, by the way, the table settled that for me anyway, even if I didn't know that this was necessarily going to be an infinite limit. Once I observed that behavior, that's the conclusion I would draw. Okay, uh, let's do the same thing. Let's use that same function, but let's do that same sort of determination, but instead of using the tabular method, let's do it algebraically. Let's just use what we know about the real number system and the function value to determine how is this function behaving. So once again, uh, the function that we're looking at this same one. So I don't, uh, I don't have a table to look at. I want to figure out, uh, well first of all, I'm going to make the, the same conclusion as before based on the behavior of the limit point. Um, I know this is going to be infinite. Negative 2 over 0 means that this will be infinite. The question is, which direction? So let's look at the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left. What can we say about the value of the uh, function on the left-hand side of negative 2? Um, well, we, all we really need to know is signs. The new sign of the numerator, the sign of the denominator. If I know the comparison of those two signs, then I know which direction this thing is going to be heading. Um, so if I'm to the left of negative 2, what do I know about x? Not only that, how does it compare to negative 2 itself? It's less than. Okay, so uh, from the left-hand side, I know that x has to be less than negative 2. Okay. So what does that tell me about x plus 2? What does that tell me about this denominator? It's negative. So coming from the left, that implies that x is a smaller number. That implies that x plus 2 is negative. And this is the denominator of my fraction, so if I'm coming from the left-hand side, the denominator of this fraction is negative. Okay, what about the numerator? About the numerator of this fraction, if I'm to the left of negative 2, what is the sign of the numerator? Negative. So, from this direction, uh, at least with respect to the function values, for all values along this approach, the numerator is negative, the denominator is negative, so what does that tell me about the function values? They're positive. If the function values are positive, that implies that the limit is going to negative, uh, positive infinity. 
So there, that exact same conclusion that I observed through the tables, I can settle that algebraically because if I'm to the left of negative 2 that I know both the numerator and denominator are negative and that means the behavior must be in the positive direction. Okay, so by exactly the same reasoning, uh, what happens if I'm to the right of negative 2 and I'm approaching our function from that direction? Now, what's the relationship between x and negative 2? If I'm to the right of negative 2, how does x compare? How does the uh, variable compare to negative 2 itself? It's got to be larger. So, what does that mean? That means that x plus 2 is positive. So, the right hand side, the denominator is positive. Uh, the question is, what about the numerator? How is the numerator behaving? Now, of course, I'm to the right of negative 2, then, you know, if that's, all, if that's the only concern, I can't be sure because it, it could be, x could be positive. If x is positive, it's still to the right of negative 2, but this is a limit, so not only is it to the right of negative 2, but it's still close to it, right? So it's to the right of negative 2, but close to negative 2, so it still has to be negative. So uh, from both directions, I still get a negative on top for the numerator. Um, and I still get a positive, and now I get a positive on the bottom for the denominator. So now the limit, the function values are negative. And again, don't forget, right, how do I know this numerator? So this is to the right, but close to. Without the limit process being uh, understood here, then there's some ambiguity there. But as long as I know that x is getting closer to negative 2, then I know that at some point, as it approaches, it's got to become negative. And the closer it gets, it stays negative. Uh, so right but close to still means negative. And so there, now I can draw the conclusion. The limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right-hand side, negative infinity, because the fraction is neg all values close to negative 2, but to the right, they're all negative. I knew it's infinite because I recognize the infinite form right here. The direction is determined by the algebraic properties of the fraction. And once again, the same conclusion for the big limit. So based on these two results, now I know the limit as x approaches negative 2 as uh, independent of direction does not exist. Okay. okay, so there's two ways. Two ways to determine the limit behavior in the infinite case. Uh, this tabular method really gives us the exact same information we got uh, from the algebraic method um, as far as uh, positive or negative behavior, increasing, decreasing behavior, um, but uh, we don't really need to go that to that extreme. Now there will be cases in which uh, all this is not as obvious and the tabular method might be a more efficient method for doing the estimation, but we can, uh, in the simple cases, we can solve this problem algebraically and identify those solutions directly. Okay, so let's actually do a little bit of, uh, this, let's determine a little bit of graphic behavior here. Here's a function. Um, what does this function have asymptotes and uh, what, how does the function behave about the asymptotes? And to answer those questions, we really just need to do the limit process, solve those problems. Okay, okay. Uh, does this graph have an asymptote and where is it, if it does? Does it? Yes? Where? No. Uh, uh, where? Where does it have an asymptote? x equals 1, yeah. It has an asymptote if the numerator is going to 0, but the denominator is not. So clearly, um, I'm looking, at your, to answer that question, you're always looking at this denominator. Under what conditions is the denominator going to be equal to 0? Is it possible? If it's not possible, then there can't be an asymptote. Now, just because we have a 0 here doesn't mean there will be an asymptote, but 
Okay, so we solve this equation in the usual way. Of course, if 1 minus x squared is equal to 0, uh, that can only happen if 1 minus x is equal to 0, uh, so uh, x equals 1. That's where the denominator goes to 0. That's the potential location of an asymptote. Potential. Okay, so now we'll check. Let's verify that there really is an asymptote there. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the limit as x approaches 1 for this function. What do I get? The limit, the infinite form. What I'm looking for, I want to make sure that the numerator is not going to zero at the same time. If both parts of the fraction are going to zero at the same time, then that's a whole different case. That's the indeterminate case. Maybe it's infinite, maybe it's not. But this, now, I'm certain. This value here tells me that this will be, this, this is infinite behavior and there must be an asymptote here. Okay. So now all I've got to do is figure out what's happening from the two directions. So let's see here. Um, what can we say about this expression? And of course, what we're really doing now, we're comparing the numerator and the denominator with respect to their signs. So, uh, in fact, I'm just going to, uh, in this case, uh, we'll just make the general observation. Uh, close to the point 1. What's the sign of the numerator? If I'm close to 1, then the numerator is close to 1. Doesn't matter which side I'm on, still going to be positive. So close to 1, the numerator is a positive number. What about the denominator? What can I say about the square of 1 minus x for a point that's close to 1? Is it positive or negative? It's positive. And of course, uh, you know, it's the, the square. Uh, now, on the left, uh, if x is to the left of 1, that's going to be a positive number being squared. If x is to the right of 1, that's going to be a negative number being squared, but it doesn't matter. In the real number system, at least, all squares are positive. So in this case, that's the only observation I need to make. That square power in the numerator means that this denominator must be greater than zero as long as x is close to but not equal to one. Okay, so what's the conclusion? What can I say now about the limit as x approaches one of this function? I know it has to be infinite. And from uh, this observation here, I can see that it's independent of direction. Left-hand side, the, fractions will be, the function values will always be positive. Right-hand side, the function values will always be positive. So this limit here, the big limit, exists. It's equal to infinity. Um, so uh, here's an example of a function whose values don't change their sign. That square power in the denominator uh, you know, the difference is the subtraction, right? When I'm subtracting a value on one side or the other. But the square power takes care of that distinction. Uh, the negative value being squared results in a positive value, the same way as a positive value does. And so now I know a little bit of something about what this graph must look like. Um, now, you know, there's a lot more details that I could throw in here. Um, but I know this graph has an asymptote here at 1. Um, well, let's go ahead. Sure, let's, let's go ahead and throw in a little bit more detail. Um, what's the y-intercept of this graph? Yeah, that's a good question. What's the y-intercept of this graph? How do I find the y-intercept of a graph? Yeah, set x to 0, 
Okay, what is f of zero? Zero. Yeah, so the numerator is zero, the denominator is one, so... In fact, that's the both, that's the x and the y-intercept. In fact, now I can see uh, that once this graph passes through zero, uh, the function values become negative. So over here on this side, I've got this graph moving in the upper direction, and then as I pass through the origin, all the function values start to become negative because to the left of zero, the numerator will be negative. Even the denominator is always positive. So just that little bit of detail there uh, shows me that uh, this graph, at least uh, on the left-hand side, has this behavior. Um, let's see, what can we say about the other side? Um, I don't know, let's just pick one point for reference. Uh, I don't know, uh, if x is equal to 2, uh, where's the point? Oh, and by the way, uh, there's two things I know now. On the left-hand side, uh, well, yeah, nothing's more complicated than that. So I guess, uh, I guess the best we can do is, is this. At least I know by the time I get here to the point 2. Um, what's the function value going to be? Yes, yeah, so that's the point two two. So I don't know. I don't know if I, uh, you know. Uh, but this is part. Uh, this is to come, right? Uh, right now, we don't have quite enough machinery to actually uh, analyze this graph uh, anymore. Uh, at this point, uh, as uh, we move forward, probably it'll be, it'll be a while. It'll be a month or so. Uh, but we'll be able to uh, analyze this graph in a lot more detail. Um, but at least this part, right? At least we know this much about the graph now. This graph has an asymptote at x equals 1, and it's moving in the positive direction as I approach the asymptote from either side. So at least that much of the graph we know for sure. Um, now, the rest, the other details, uh, we'll have to look more carefully at it, but there we go. Okay, so... Um, What about this one? What about this function? Does this graph have a mass asymptote? If it does, where would I find it? And once I find it, how does the function behave around it? Does it? What am I looking for? If I'm trying to verify that this function has a um, asymptote. What am I looking at? I'm looking to figure out when does the denominator go to zero. The first uh, uh, one um, necessary condition for the asymptote is that the denominator goes to zero. So the first part of the test is going to be under what conditions does this denominator go to zero? Okay. Well, that's essentially asking the question when does e to the x equal 1. When x equals 0. Again, I hope, I hope everybody can see that. Uh, really, the uh, now, uh, in, in the general case, you solve exponential equations using logarithms. But this case is simple enough. I hope everybody knows that any, any number besides 0, any number besides 0 raised to 0 power is equal to 1. So uh, that's the only way this could happen. So I hope everybody can see that by inspection. Again, if I were actually going to solve this in a more general sense, I'd have to apply logarithms. Uh, and we'll look at logarithms in a little, a little more detail when the time comes. But Okay, so the denominator goes to zero when x is zero. Well, what about the numerator? What happens to the numerator as x goes to zero? So once again, I'm looking at this. I want to consider the limit form as x approaches zero of this expression. I already know what's happening in the denominator. The denominator is going to zero. I chose that value just because that was going to happen. Uh, what is the numerator going to? One. So just like we said before, uh, e to the zero, there's a direct substitution. There's a limit passing through the operator. I let x go to zero. That evaluates to one. So once again, I know this will be an asymptote. There's my infinite limit form. Had to look at both parts, though. It's not enough just to look at the denominator. Had to look at the numerator, too. It's my infinite limit form, so I know this function does have an asymptote. 
The question is, how does it behave? How, if I look, were to look at the graphic structure of this, what would I see on either side of the asymptote? So we've got now, uh, now we're going to have to be a little bit more careful. Um, uh, what can we say about the numerator of this fraction? In fact, let's just put it this way. What do you know about the sign of e to the x? It's always, it's always positive. Right? If you start with the positive number, no matter what power you raise it to, it's still going to be positive. Negative powers, fractional powers, doesn't matter. No positive number raised to any power can be anything but positive. So I know that for sure. The numerator is always positive. So once again, this analysis that we're doing to this fraction form uh, is trying to make that distinction. On either side of the limit point, how do this, the two parts of the fraction behave? Well, very similar to what we saw in the last case, uh, this numerator is independent of direction. Doesn't matter which side of zero I'm on, e to the negative power or e to the positive power is always a positive number. So the numerator is fixed. What can I say about the denominator? Uh, in fact, let's go ahead, uh, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, to the left, to the left is zero, what can I say about this quantity? It's always negative, because why? And here we need to know a little bit about the structure of the original exponential function uh, because, um, uh, in fact, let's go ahead and look at it. You know, the, uh, the standard exponential function is an increasing function passing through the point uh, 1, 0. Right? There's the standard graph of e to the x. Um, how do I recover the graph of uh, e to the x minus 1? If I know what the graph of e to the x looks like, what does the graph of e to the x minus 1 look like? Shift it down. Right? Negative 1 means shift it down one unit. This is a vertical shift. So just from what I learned in pre-calculus 1, now I know graphically why uh, the left-hand side of zero forces this value to be negative. Because if I drop this graph down one unit, what do I see? Well, the old asymptote at one zero is now an asymptote of the origin. To the right of the origin, this graph is going to be increasing. To the left of the origin, this graph is going to be decreasing. So on the left-hand side, it's always negative. The other way around. So on the left-hand side, it's always negative and to the right what do I see? Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, that's sufficient to establish the, uh, the conclusion. Uh, if this function were not an increasing function, then we would have to look at this a little bit more carefully. But from what we already know about the behavior of the exponential function, then uh, this shift down forces that, uh, that divergence. On one side of zero, I've got the negative values. On the other side of zero, I've got the positive values. Okay, so there's all the analysis that we need to now uh, settle the issues about the behavior of this infinite limit. Um, the numerator is always positive, but to the left of zero, we've got negative denominator. To the right of zero, we've got a positive denominator. So what can I say about the limit? as x approaches zero from the left of this function, it's going to be negative. Positive over negative, so this limit is approaching negative infinity. And what can I say about the limit of this function as x approaches zero from the right? I know it's infinite, the only thing I have to settle is which direction. So 
to the right of zero, both parts of the fraction are positive, so positive infinity. So once again, that settles the issue. If I were to look at this graph about zero, one side, I've got the graph moving in the downward direction. The other side, I've got the graph moving in the positive direction. So at least that much about this graphic behavior is known to me. Okay, so this graph does have an asymptote, and there it is. Oh, and by the way, uh, we didn't say this, but now what can we say about the big limit? If I was asked what, how do I describe the behavior of the limit as x approaches zero independent of direction? It does not exist, because once again, these two guys have diverged. Okay, here's a good one. I don't know, we might need more space here. Okay, here's one. Uh, where does this graph have, as, or does it? I hope everybody already knows this graph does have asymptotes. Um, in fact, you know, this problem here, uh, we're going to, in the end, we're going to use what, the, what we've just talked about to, to settle this issue. We should already know this, though. This is a basic principle out of pre-calculus 2, trigonometry. Um, and, of course, this, is a, uh, this expression here doesn't involve a fraction form, right? Up to this point, uh, everywhere that we had uh, the existence of the asymptote, the tip-off was looking for that denominator that was going to zero. So one of our trigonometric operators doesn't have a fraction form. So how could it have asymptotes? Right? We said one of the uh, necessary requirements for the existence of the asymptote is the denominator going to zero. Where does the denominator come from in this expression? What do you know about the secant function and how it's defined? It's the reciprocal of the cosine function. That's where the secant function comes from. And so here's another little pit, bit of uh, knowledge from trigonometry that we're going to need. We need to remember those reciprocal forms for our trigonometric operator. Sine and cosine are fundamental. But all the others are expressed using either ratios or reciprocals. So tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant, those are all reciprocal forms. Where does the denominator come from? Well, that's where it comes from. It comes from here. It comes from the fact that the secant is a fraction form when it's referenced back to its origin. So you got to know that. If I didn't know that, then there would be no way that I could answer this question. So now the question becomes, when does cosine go to zero? And so here's another little bit of trigonometry that we're going to have to be able to solve. For what values of x is this going to be true? Well, when is cosine equal to zero? How do you describe the set of values for which cosine is equal to zero? And again, in radian measure. Pi over two is the first location. All the odd multiples of x over two. And so, so uh, let's say, uh, so uh, that implies that pi x over 2 has to be equal to an odd multiple of pi over 2. And of course, that's exactly what this is. So the only thing here is I've got to recognize that that's what x has to be. x can be any odd number and that's what makes this equation true. So there's some more trigonometry that we have to have a good handle on. Uh, and I want you guys to know that by now. When is sine equal to zero? When is cosine equal to zero? That should be automatic. When is sine equal to zero? Zero? 
Or else. Where's the next place that sine is equal to zero? Pi. Two pi. Three pi. Four pi. All integral multiples of pi. That's where sine goes to zero. Where does cosine go to zero? All odd multiples. Pi over two. Okay, so there. This graph has an infinite number of asymptotes. Uh, oh, uh, but we gotta be we gotta be careful. So, you know, I'm moving a little bit too fast. I know where the denominator goes to zero. So let's, let's summarize that. Uh, the denominator goes to zero. Whenever x is an odd number, and of course, uh, odd integer is implied. Right? Only the integers are even or odd. Okay. Uh, what about the numerator? What about the numerator of this fraction? Can it go to zero? No. Numerator is fixed. Numerator doesn't depend on x. It's constant, in fact. So the denominator goes to zero for all add numbers. Uh, the numerator is uh, uh, always equal to one. Okay, so I did have to verify that. If there were any location where this denominator went to zero but the numerator did two, then I would have to look at that in a whole different way. But this numerator can't change, it's fixed, doesn't depend on x. So all I've got to do is look at the odd numbers. Every odd integer forces the denominator go to zero, the numerator is fixed. So this graph has an infinite number of asymptotes everywhere x is an odd number. Um, all right. And that's all we're asked here. Now, of course, uh, the next issue is about behavior around the asymptotes. Uh, at it, when I look at all these asymptotes on the, in fact, you know, if I were to draw this graph, uh, what would I see? Well, one, three, five, minus one, minus three, minus five. Every one of these locations has an asymptote. And yeah, I want them to be red. Asymptote here. Here, here, and so on. The question is, what's going on in between all these locations? Well, uh, we're not going to do that now, right? We're not going to recover that information. Uh, and now we can, you know, if we were to make a more careful analysis here, uh, we could figure out the, the basic approaches as we come up. Uh, in the neighborhood of these asymptotes. Um, but the important question, and again, this is a question we should have already been able to answer. Should have been able to answer this from what we already knew about trigonometry. But now we've been able to put it into the context of the limit. And now I can see why we have asymptotes uh, for these odd numbers. So uh, if x is odd, then we get the infinite limit form. The limit as, oh, I guess let's say a. If a is odd, then the limit as x approaches a of this function is going to end up being 1 over 0, so there's the asymptote in the uh, infinite limit form. Okay, but again, if I didn't know where that function came from and that it had a fraction form, uh, there would have been no way to answer this question. And if I didn't know when the basic cosine function went to zero, then I couldn't reproduce the values where this particular function goes to zero, the odd numbers. So once again, got to have good background in algebra, got to have good background in trigonometry. Uh, I forgot to, yeah, and again, you know, uh, as far as valuations of the trigonometric functions, uh, I know a lot of you guys don't have those memorized. I've got the trig wheel. Uh, I, I need to put post it so you can get a look at it. Uh, but it summarizes all this information about the behavior of uh, sine and cosine, at least, and uh, tangent. Those are important. Oh, by the way, another thing we use today, sine and cosine are bounded. Negative one, positive one. It's important information. You've got to be able to retrieve that when you need it. And the last of our functions is the natural logarithm. The natural logarithm has one very important property 
It's an example of a function that has an asymptote that is not fraction form. The logarithm is not fraction form. It, it can't be interpreted according to fraction forms. And yet, it has a vertical asymptote. Um, so here's one last piece of information from our, uh, and this from pre-calculus one, that we need to have available to us. Where does the logarithm have its asymptote? Yeah. Uh, the logarithm is the inverse of the exponential function. We've already talked about the exponential function. Right? The exponential function looks like this. As the in, and the uh, the uh, exponential function has an asymptote here on the x-axis. Right? As we as the uh, power becomes more negative, the function values get smaller and smaller, but they'll never become negative. Uh, as the inverse of the exponential function, the logarithm inverts that. Uh, its graph looks like this, and the asymptote now comes along this the y-axis. So, as I approach zero from the right-hand side, and I'm coming from this direction, what can we say about the value of the logarithm, or the limit, as I come in from the right to the logarithm? What is this going to be equal to? negative infinity. Okay. Oh, and by the way, this is our logarithm here. Uh, this is the, and, uh, you know, uh, how did this come about? Uh, as we said, without that uh, fraction form, how did it come about that I got a asymptote here for this function? Well, that came about through the process of inversion, creating a function through the inverse of a given function the given function had an asymptote in the horizontal direction, so the inversion puts that in the vertical direction. Um, so uh, this is one special case that we do need to, uh, uh, again, based on what we already know about the behavior of the logarithm, this is something we'll have to be able to recover. This is a graph with a vertical asymptote, even though there's no fraction form, the uh, uh, natural logarithm is not defined for negative values, it's not defined for zero, closer I get to zero, the more negative the values become. And so now that I've seen this diagram, what are we going to say about the limit as x approaches zero from the left of this function? No? Doesn't exist. This function doesn't have any part of its graph to the left of the origin. This graph is completely contained in the first and fourth quadrants. I can't approach this from the left-hand side. If I try and move in the negative side, the function values are undefined. Right? The domain of the logarithm does not include the negative numbers. So this is an example of a, it's kind of a vacuous case. It's, there's, it's not that there's a gap here. And again, here's an example of uh, some uh, pathological sort of behavior that we haven't encountered. Uh, to the left of this graph, this function's not even defined. So I can't create a path and use that pathway to evaluate the function, right? Function's not defined there. So here's an example of the breakdown of the existence of a limit, not because of any uh, particular, not because of gaps or asymptotes. It's because there's simply no definition of this function on that side of the number line. Okay, so these last two, in fact, uh, these last three, all of these are examples of some, uh, and again, if you don't, you, I know some of us, got, we haven't seen this in a while. It's been over a year since we saw this stuff uh, from the uh, pre-calculus one, trigonometry, I don't know, four or five months old. Uh, but uh, these are some of the basic sorts of, uh, of uh, aspects of the logarithm, the exponential function, the trigonometric operators. It's the kind of stuff that we're going to have to recover. Um, uh, as we uh, start our analysis along the lines of the calculus. Um, so, uh, and as we go along, I'll, I'll do a little bit of uh, uh, review. And, you know, we reviewed branch functions today. We did a little bit of that. Uh, we did a little bit of review of trigonometry, a little bit of review of the logarithm, uh, as needed. Uh, but I hope you guys recognize that when you see it. I hope that a bell goes off in your head. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember. I've seen it before. Sure. I remember that. Okay. okay. So we talked about it now.
we need it in the future. Hope you're ready to pull that out of your memory banks. Uh, okay, so uh, there's an analysis of uh, the uh, infinite limit, how we uh, determine infinite limits. It all comes down to this. Right? Anytime you see that limit form where the numerator is not zero, you know it's got to be infinite. The only question is which direction? Well, for fraction forms, that can be solved by just looking at the signs of the numerator and the denominator. On one side of the limit, if there is an asymptote, on one side of the asymptote, you'll always get the same sign on either side. Right? That won't change. The question is which direction? Same direction, opposite directions, which way is it going on which side? All those questions can be answered algebraically through the basic analyses that we did here. Um, but, uh, you know, this pathological example of the infinite number of asymptotes for these trigonometric operators and the behavior of the logarithm, uh, those are things that uh, um, we have to toss in with uh, our basic understanding of the rational functions. Okay, I think I'll stop there. So, there, we've covered uh, the first two homeworks. We covered the first homeworks on uh, the branch functions and the squeeze theorem, second homeworks on the uh, infinite limit. Uh, next time we'll do the last homework. We'll talk about continuity. Oh, I'll uh, I'll grade the quizzes. I'll have those back Wednesday. I'll post the entry key here in the next couple of days if you want to go back and look at that, see how you did. Um, but uh, we'll do that on Wednesday too. So. Okay, have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you next time. Are the uh, trigonometric functions?